Hello. Lots of lots of good noise happening. Fellowship. That corner's still going, so we'll give them a minute. Hello, everybody at home, if there's anybody joining us. I don't even know yet, so. Everybody doing good? Yes, two of you doing good. That's good to know. That's good to know. Um, not as good but God, but you're... I guess I'm asking you a fleshly question. You feeling good in a natural way? Yes. Um, we're going to get started here in just a moment when I actually open up my notes because I've been blabbing my mouth instead of getting ready. And I know that's hard for some of you to believe, but it did happen. <laughs> been having to fix chairs because Bob Allison decided to go eat one extra meal last week instead of coming to church <laughs> and sitting in the chair and breaking it. And... Uh, had nothing to do with the poor construction, of course, <laughs> but um, glad that you're here with us tonight and uh, our, our time together. I don't, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We may, we may have a short time together tonight. Short's okay, amen? amen. Um, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> how, about, how about adequate time? We'll have an adequate time That's together. Adequate. Yes, it is. Chris, th those are your two statements that you're allowed to share tonight, so thank you for... <laughs> Get ready to start. Man, I love you guys. It's good to be with you. It's good to see you, and um, uh, just, I'm just grateful. Grateful for you, grateful for our church, um, grateful to God for so many wonderful things in my life, and you know, folks, if, if, we, if we didn't dive into the Word at all tonight, which we're going to, don't worry, we're going to. But if we didn't have one more ounce of a revelation from Jesus Christ tonight for ourselves, we'd have more than enough to praise Him for all of eternity. Amen. I mean, I, I'm just grateful for salvation. I don't, I don't deserve this grace. I don't deserve this love. And thank God I didn't have to earn it because I never could have. Uh, so I'm just thankful for God's grace, and it's by His grace that I, I stand before you tonight. It's by His grace that He's even allowed us to walk into these doors with breath in our lungs. I was in a training session yesterday all day long and uh, for ministry training and leadership. And I told April, I said, you know, when you go in these things, um, they're intentionally there to challenge you, you know, to, to, to push you and guide you and help you be stretched and grown. But when you go into something like that and you're sitting in there for six hours tired before you get there, I said, I don't feel stretched. I feel offended. I don't, I don't feel stretched. I feel like, I'm like, man, I, I, I didn't go in there motivated to be like, you know what? We're going to work on these things and do better. It's like I walk out going, I'm the worst pastor on the face of the earth. <laughs> um, but uh, I got to spend some time with some men of God last night. Who, our board members, I just want to say publicly, thank you to uh, Brian Allison. Thank you to, uh, my goodness, who are they? Herb King. Thank you to Gene Bonesteel. Thank you to Brent Walters. Thank you to Greg Seitz. And, uh, you know, I got to sit down with those guys and pray with them and laugh and eat and just work through church business and finances and stuff. And I told April when I left last night, I left encouraged. And how, how cool is it to be in a quote-unquote business meeting, if you will, and, and to sense the presence of God and just sense the love of God through one another and to go home grateful and thankful and, and uh, full of love. And I say all that, say all that to say this, that just walking in this building and being around you all, I'm grateful. I'm thankful. And, um, you know, 18 years of ministry in this building, six years in youth ministry, 12 in here. And uh, I don't see this as a right or a privilege to be in front of you. I, it's truly a humbling thing, and I'm just thankful. I don't know, I just felt the need to express that tonight. I'm just thankful for all of you, and uh, thank you for letting me be your pastor. We're well blessed all the way around. God's good, isn't he, Aretha? He is good. So, having said that tonight, having buttered you up, I must be playing on something really harsh. Just kidding. 
Um, we'll, we'll open up with just a quick word of prayer. Uh, we do want to pray for uh, this family who's going to be burying their daughter tomorrow. Um, very, very tough situation. We prayed for little Benny for several weeks, and she did pass away last Friday, and, and the family tomorrow is going to have her funeral services, and, and so we do want to lift that family up in prayer. But hey, listen, it's not all defeat. That, that little girl's with Jesus. And this family, it's not defeat for them, though I know it's difficult, and I, I, I don't, that's a burden I don't ever want to have to bear. Um, I know that our, our God's good, and he's going to see him through it. He's going to use it for his glory. So we're going to pray for that family for that reason. Anything else tonight that we need to bring to the Lord quickly? Awesome. Yes. Because of that experience. Because yes. they've gone through this. And yep. Because, and because they didn't lose yes. hope. Yes. They're pressing yeah. on. She, died of... she had leukemia. It, it was just, they were hoping it was going to be juvenile leukemia and that it, oftentimes juvenile leukemia is curable. So they were hoping that they, it was going to be the curable type and unfortunately it was not. So it's only been a few months couple months, not even two full months that it was discovered. So if there's not anything else, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, actually, before we do, are there any praise reports? Let's go to the Lord with a, at least a praise report before we go to this need, for this need. Frank. We're still alive. We're still alive. Praise God, you're okay. For real. God's good. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else? Yes. Not completely, but I'm leaving it open for you. Praise God. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah, folks, you don't always know what's happening in people's lives when they walk in and out of the door. So love on one another. Amen? And if you have a relationship enough for them to say, hey, would you pray for me? Pray for them. Amen. Any, anybody else? Yes. Joyce. Really? So they're moving back. That's fulfillment of prophecy. The Lord's saying he'll bring them back home. Very cool. Jesus is coming back, folks. We'll never forget it. I saw another hand. Did I see, was it you, Retha? That's awesome. I pray when I'm your age, they say the same thing about me. <laughs> That's awesome. Praise God for that. And we love that report because we love you. And we're grateful for you. To, we want you well. Every time you walk, you're the, like I keep saying, you and Janice and mom, you three would support me no matter what. And Janice is in the hospital and mom's in Florida. So, Retha, I need you to be well. Uh, Anything else, and we'll go to the Lord in prayer together for, for this family. Stanley. Andrew, the young man of God, leukemia. Mm -hmm. you know, we last time we had a praise report, and then he got worse. Mm -hmm. He didn't know it was going to make it. His leukemia is supposed to be treated. Well, he's been through a lot, but he's doing much better now. He's in rehab. And yeah. So we don't understand all the struggles we go through. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Yes, for sure, for sure. He doesn't abandon us in our struggles, does he? Well, let's go. Oh, one more. Hey, I'm going to shut down praise reports. Let's go. Yes.
Awesome. Praise God for that. I see I got a message from my mom. Pray for her blood pressure. I, maybe we should pray for dad because that's what sends her blood pressure up sometimes. <laughs> Love you, mama. We're going to pray for you. See you Sunday night. So let, let's pray together. Father, we thank you. God, you're just good. You are good, Lord. We just praise you. We worship you, church. Just praise him and thank him in your own way. He's good. Father, these praise reports, we praise you and thank you for them. God, we thank you that you are the God who heals. You're the God who guides and directs. You're the God who ministers to bodies, but more importantly, the God who ministers to souls. God, we just receive you right now. We, we invite you, Lord, to minister to us tonight. It's not my words, Lord, it's your words, and that this fellowship here, God, together, of believers together would be Christ-centered fellowship. Father, be exalted in this place. Be exalted in our lives and our conversation and all that we do tonight. We thank you for these praise reports. We thank you for Misty's praise report, God. Thank you for protection there. Thank you for protection for Frank and Belinda, God. Thank you, Lord, that this, this young man, Andrew, is going to be uh, ushered further and further in depth of knowledge and understanding and wisdom of you through this trial. Heal him completely, Jesus. Heal him completely, Father. Thank you for covering Dale and ministering to him in these days. Thank you for touching Janice, Father. I pray you would heal her completely right now in Jesus' name. And, Father, you would touch Mom with her blood pressure issues, God. May it, may it go down and never return. There would be peace in her heart and mind about it and physical peace in her body, that her body would prosper as her soul prospers, God. That's our prayer. And Father, we do pray for Benny's family as they prepare to lay her body to rest tomorrow, Lord. I know that this sweet girl's at rest in your presence. This gut-wrenching reality of, of life and death. God, I know you're going to resurrect her, and I know that she's at peace with you. But Father, I pray that this family right now would discover and develop peace in their hearts with you. And, and uh, like Chris said, Father, that this time tomorrow would be used. Tomorrow and the days ahead, that names would be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, I, I pray that you would redeem this, this great pain for this family and this cost with souls. Redeem it with souls, we pray. So, Father, minister to this mother and father, this, this uh, sibling, and uh, God, give them peace. And all that who knew her and knew this, knows this family, God, give them peace tomorrow. Extended family, grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins, minister to them, Lord. We just lay this family at your feet. We know that if you hold the, the, the earth in your hands and you hold the, the stars in your hands, God, you hold us and you love us above all of those things. And I know you love that family. So minister to them. We thank you for it, Lord. Guide our time tonight. Guide our our conversation, and I pray that you would be glorified in all of it as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What's the Lord saying to you? Anything good? In your reading time, anything that's come up that you want to share or talk about? Watch me put Tony to work. Tony, Tony's going to pass these papers out because that's what he does. Look at him serving over here. Um, were you getting ready to say something, Tony? Were you looking at your notes? Or you were just like searching like Facebook? I was searching Facebook. Were you? That's good. Okay. I expected that. TikTok. TikTok. I don't really have anything the Lord showed me, but this TikTok video is hilarious, Pastor. <laughs> Anybody else? Anything from your reading that, that maybe spoke to you the last week? Stirred you, Joyce? Yes. Yes. And I've had a lot of miracles happen in my family, in mm -hmm. with me in particular. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, your children haven't experienced those things. Right. And I, I was trying to think how much of it, all that I told them and, and what I just experienced and didn't really, they, they were kind of young. Right. Right. And then there's no doubt. Yes. When miracles happen to you, you can't right. refute it. You know? Right. 
So what Joyce said, I don't know if anybody, if everybody could hear that or not, but Joyce was just talking about how, to, how in Deuteronomy 11 it talks about what the children of Israel were, were to do to walk in obedience to God. And it goes on talking about how their children had not seen the signs. In other words, the signs of what took place in Egypt, uh, all those gods, Egyptian gods thwarted the parting of the Red Sea, the visible presence, manifestation of the Holy Spirit of God with them, the tabernacle, the burning mountain, the manna, the quail. They didn't see all that stuff. And so uh, that's why Deuteronomy required that they would teach the children these things and, and impart these things because they weren't blessed enough to be there to see it. Um, and Joyce's concern was, as I've had experiences in my life, miracles in my life, encounters with God in my life that I have told my children about, but they maybe haven't seen for themselves yet. And, and you read a psalm this week as well. And again, being three weeks ahead, I'm thinking back. I should do better at refreshing myself. But I believe the same week, there's one of the psalms that mentioned uh, we, we, uh, we do not see our signs. One of them that said that in that statement. And I, I thought back to the very thing you're talking about. They're looking for these signs that God had done that would be irrefutable uh, in the things that, that, that they want to see and experience. The difference is this, they know, and it has been experienced, and it has been passed down, and that's the call for it. But I can, I can relate to what Joyce is saying, and maybe we can talk about it for a minute, the desire for our children to um, experience and encounter Christ, their own salvation, uh, their own deep faith that isn't based upon genealogy or heritage, or anything else. Something my dad used to tell us oftentimes on Sunday mornings when we were dragging our feet and not ready to go to church, he'd sit in there and he'd say, you better get up and get dressed. He said, nobody's riding into heaven on my coattails. You're going to have to figure this thing out for yourself and, and make us get up and, and go to church. And I'm sitting there thinking, what's a coattail? I had to figure out what a coattail was. <laughs> but I understood that whatever it was, it wasn't good. And I knew I needed to be there and was supposed to be there. And, and so for all of us, it's important for us to have those experiences with Christ, our salvation, baptism, Holy Spirit, healings. How many of us in here have experienced personal physical healing from the Lord before? Yeah. How many of us have ever witnessed God do a miraculous healing in somebody else's life? Yeah. So these things, uh, baptism, the Holy Spirit, have you ever been used in a gift before? Tongues, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, word of knowledge, those kinds of things. Have you ever been used in those things before? Yeah, we've been used in those things. So it's one thing to tell our children about that, and it's important. They've got to be told for the sake of them knowing and understanding that this is for me, it's good, God has it for me, so that they can receive it themselves. And I, and I think that's what Joyce is saying here. I don't want to send my kids out into the life of this world for the rest of their lives and be too, you know, a generation or two away from uh, our, our family not really knowing, the, knowing Christ like I know him. I want them to experience the power of God as I've experienced it. I don't want my family's experience of the power of God to be my experience then dwindles off for the next generation to the next until three generations down the road they're living in absolute sin. Um, I think it's important that we need to make sure that our ministries here at our church are exposing our kids to the type of environment to where they can themselves begin to exercise and believe God to move in their lives as well. So any, anything open for discussion on that point? Anybody else ever feel that way? Now granted, I understand this is a parallel. This is Joyce parallel in her life kind of with what was happening with Israel. It's not necessarily a, a deep study into what was happening theologically with Israel in that moment, but, but that is still a good talking point. Yes? Um, the children of Israel took 40 years right. to go through that journey. Mm -hmm. And there were children born along the way. Yes. And uh, the older ones didn't get to go right. to the new land. And I was thinking, well, a generation is 40 years. Correct. Yes. And we don't always talk about every single thing. Right. But it's all very important to the people that have the truth. Correct. And that's why, that's why Moses told the children of Israel, speak these things to your children when you rise, when you lay down, when you come, when you go, and put it on the walls of your house and the, and the entrance to your door. I don't remember all the layers of it, but he was saying, make this important. Make this 
use every, and kind of how we always interpret that in our family and how I've interpreted it in ministry is you can take any moment and turn it into a spiritual moment to discuss something eternal. You really can. Um, we used to play a game with that when I was in youth ministry in our, in our guys groups. We would joke about it and say, I can make anything into a sermon. And they would just come in with a topic and they would throw it out and then we would turn it into a sermon and we'd laugh about it. But the, the reason we would do that was to teach them this is how, this is how you take a conversation that seems very carnal and natural in the beginning and you turn it heavenward and create a moment with it. And the best example of that is the woman at the well. Okay, Jesus comes up and there's a conversation about water and thirst and then he turns it, turns it vertical. And so when you look at that account, he's speaking to a Gentile woman, a uh, Samaritan woman, and, and trying to help lead her to understanding of her situation that she would repent, that she would know himself, know God. And for us in our lives, we've got to approach our children that way. You know, you've got to, when I was a ranger leader, you know, and even as a father at times, we take things, you know, if, for example, there's a fire here, you know, the, the classic campfire devotion for boys when you're camping out. Boys, this fire, what does it need? Well, yeah, it's got to have, you know, it's got to have tinder, it's got to have this, it's got to have, and so you start talking about how to build a fire, you start talking about how to fuel a fire, you talk about what a fire needs, it needs breathed on, and you start bringing these elements together and you start teaching them about God's relationship to us and the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us and into how to feed that fire and how to, how to pour onto it, and pretty soon you're sitting around with a bunch of 8 to 12 year olds and you're discussing something in depth that they can comprehend. So in all of our lives, if we've experienced the power of God in the past, we must be able to communicate it to the next generation so that they have understanding. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So that they have understanding, first of all. Second of all, that they would have understanding by life experience, by stepping into those things. The children of Israel had understanding about the promised land when they got the reports, right? Lack of understanding is what kept them out, right? You had the ten who said no. And the two that said yes, and they went with the majority. It was, a, it was a democracy, right? Just kidding. God kept them out. So the second time they go in and they do what they got to do, and they, they understand then what's in front of them. They understand then what's there. So they understand it across the sea, but it was something across the, the Jordan River, but it was something different to step into it. So in our lives, we've got to teach understanding, but then we must allow our understanding to step into it so that there's a greater understanding, a new level of understanding of it. And so there are some things that God will teach us about the Holy Spirit through Scripture and what we know the Scripture says about the Holy Spirit, so we will identify Him. But stepping into and, and uh, allowing my, my life to be yielded to the Holy Spirit for anointing, for baptism, for whatever a use of a gift, when I yield myself to him, when I step into that gift and I'm used in it, I now have an even deeper understanding than I thought I had before. So for all of us, for our children, for ourselves, we must grow in our learning and understanding. We've got to teach our children what we've experienced and we must empower them with the confidence to be able to step into those experiences themselves. And Joyce, here's what I know about you and Greg. You did a good job. You did a really good job. Yeah. Number one. But there's nothing like an experiential yeah. Holy Ghost <laughs> <laughs> experience. Yes, yes, ma'am. I agree 100%. And that's why we teach them, that's why we pray for them, and that's why we give encounters. Here's a great advertisement. You ready? I don't know if we got parents, very many parents in the room that send your kids to camp. Hey, send your kids to camp. It's worth every penny. Amen. That's That's putting them in an environment where they're out of the regular world for five days or whatever it is, four days, and they are absolutely immersed in an environment where they can experience the very things that are being taught here in this building and opportunities in this building. That just creates a safe environment for them to step in with others. Camp is a great, great opportunity. Send your kids. If you've got grandkids, pay for your grandkids to go. Tell your moms and dads, well, it's expensive, mom and dad. Well, grandma and grandpa will pay for it. And if, and if none of you can afford it, tell me, I'll pay for it. Because I, April and I are products of this church and camp. Transformed us. So, Anything else tonight? Anybody speak to what Joyce is talking about or, or a different thought quickly before we dive into the other stuff? Thank you, Joyce. That was good.
It's a good challenge. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah. That'll get you, 30, 36 bucks will get you registered nowadays. A t-shirt. <laughs> a t-shirt. Registration and a t-shirt. It's worth every penny. And, and it has gone up this year, uh, but the church, we always give scholarships and we help as much as we can. And the funding that we have there, we, our, our family should pay very little, very little above registration to be able to go. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Well, if nobody else has anything, if you want to turn to Luke 11, we're going to do a bit of a refresh um, because uh, this is a topic that I shared at a prayer meeting in November of last year. Uh, just I might expound a little bit more here tonight because the prayer meeting, the purpose was to pray a little bit. Um, tonight, I, I want to encourage you in your prayer life, if that makes any sense. And um, we, may take, we may take a few minutes and pray at the end here just to exercise it a little bit. But, but more than anything, I want us to grasp, based off of something you read this last week in Luke, um, not only what we know as the Lord's Prayer or a prayer model to help us know how to pray, but the heart behind it and the confidence we can have that the Father hears us. Am I the only person in the room that, or joining us online that has ever felt like I've prayed and I don't know that God heard me? Yeah, I mean, there are times your emotions and your, your heart and you can just be so downcast. Listen, if you're ever downcast, if you've ever been downcast, uh, don't, don't feel alone. Read the Psalms. Why am I downcast? Oh, my soul. I mean, David's been downcast and and Asaph downcast, and all these psalmists downcast, and I love how raw they are. Most of the times, they're downcast, and then they, they praise themselves into being uplifted, and I think there's a lesson there in that to be learned as well. But for, for all of us, we've had our moments where we've thought to ourselves, um, why isn't God moving in this situation? Am I not heard? And so our tendency a lot of times is to feel like he's not listening. Because, for example, if somebody in a natural way, you, you say something to them and they don't react and they keep looking straight, you're like, hey, April, 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 April. You know what I'm saying? Because April blocks me out all the time, you know, so what'd you say? Should be the other way around. Yeah, I know. I think everybody in the room knows that, babe, so it's okay. But... So your natural instinct is to move to a new level of desperation and demand and coercion and not even really manipulation, but just trying to get them to move and, and respond in some capacity. You know, if there's not a response, this goes up, why, you know, and then comes the question, why aren't you listening to me, right? And a lot of times we will attribute the natural issues of mankind to an eternal God who is not a man. And I want to encourage us tonight, first and foremost, before we even dive into this, the Father always hears you when you pray. He pray. He, he hears you. Now, are there things that can hinder your prayers? Most definitely. There's biblical backing to things that can hinder your prayers. Things like sin can hinder your prayers. If you've sinned, Scripture says scripturally, if you've sinned against your wife, it will hinder your prayers. Scripture says, and I, I believe that goes both ways, ladies. I really do. That was being written to men, so it was directed toward men, but the principle is true. If we're sinning against our spouse on a regular basis and we won't live in that relationship of love, mercy, compassion, it can hinder us. I mean, Scripture also makes clear about our relationships and how we are amongst our brothers and sisters here. If we're holding something against them or they hold something against us, we need to deal with that before we bring our gift to the altar, right? Before we worship. There are things that can affect, there are some horizontal things that can affect our, our vertical relationship with the Father. Because the great commandment is, is that we would love God and we would love our neighbor, right? So these two things interact together. Now, 
there are some things that can, can hinder and affect that. So if there are those moments that come, this is just a little side momentary teaching. teaching. If you feel like you're not being heard in a thing and you're praying about it, maybe you ought to do some self-evaluation and instead of praying about that thing, say, Holy Spirit, is there something in me that's hindering this at the moment? Is there an attitude? Is there unforgiveness? Is there, is there uh, something that I have caused that, that is sinful that I need to deal with? So we've evaluated that. We feel, by the Holy Spirit, we feel like we've, we've dealt with those things. So what do we do? Let's look at Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Stop for a second. Corporate prayer is very important. Do you know... Do you know that if you're going to lead somebody closer to Jesus, at some point you're going to have to pray with them? At some point, if, if you're discipling anyone, at some point they need to hear how you pray. Now, I'm not just talking style. I'm talking depth. I'm talking do you pray first and foremost. Uh, just like I shared a couple weeks ago about the gentleman that I run into at the restaurant, and he said, Pastor, are you a praying man? And I love that question because it had two things in there. It had two parts. Pastor, first and foremost, are you praying? And you know you can be a pastor and not pray. And so it was exciting to me to have somebody actually ask that question, Pastor, are you a praying man? And I thought, this guy gets it. He knows. He knows some people do this without prayer and intercession. And I was able to pray with him. But at some point, if we're going to impart anything to anybody's life, we've got to pray with them. They must know your prayer life. And if they're not interested in your prayer life, and they're only interested in what you can give them, it's a dangerous sign. I had people tell me that they fired staff because their staff wouldn't come pray with them. They said, I had staff in my church. I told them prayer time is this time. They didn't come. The next day, I said, you're going to come to prayer tomorrow. They show up. Then the next day, they didn't come. They show up. And then about the third week of it, and they weren't showing up to prayer, they said, you need to find you a new job because I don't want to preach and work with somebody that's not on the same team with me. If you can't pray with me, you can't work with me. I thought that was a little stiff, but... So? It's so? Retha's fine with it. <laughs> Pastor Zach? <laughs> they pray. We pray together. We have prayed together. We don't pray together every day. But my point is this, folks, is if you're going to disciple somebody, you're going to have to do what Jesus did. Jesus had them in the vicinity with him praying, and he had such a prayer life that they looked in and said, I don't know what that is, but I want it. I want to know how to do that. From a group of people who had allowed uh, priests to do their intercession for them in the past and all these things, it's like, wow, he's approaching the Father right there. I want to know how to do that. So that's what comes up here. Sorry, I didn't mean to go off on a rabbit trail, but... He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us, uh, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And we know that prayer very well, and we'll come back to it in a moment. Verse 5, then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come up to me and I have something to set before him. Then the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. So just look at a couple things there. Don't bother me. The door's locked. My children are with me. In other words, you're not important. I'm in bed. I'm sleeping. I'm resting. I can't. You hear that? I can't get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So in other words, this guy's in bed. He's got his kids with him. They're all sleeping there together, warm. The kids are quiet. And we all know once the kids are asleep, don't wake up the kids. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> yes, keep them quiet. For the love of God, keep them quiet. But because you were persistent and because you were bold and you yelled, that's why he would come out. Hmm. So I say to you, verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. For everyone, how, how many is that? That's all. For everyone who asks receives, right? He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So let's talk about this for a moment. So those first few verses, 2 through 4, is giving us the model of prayer, if you will, that we're going to talk about in a moment. But uh, 5 through 13 gives us understanding uh, with which we should pray understanding and knowledge of how we should approach the Lord. Now, we already know that through Christ and through His sacrifice, we are invited into His throne room, so we are to come boldly. Now, boldly is not arrogantly, boldly is not obnoxiously, boldly is coming with confidence, with understanding. I can walk in. Alyssa used to, I've used this example before, when she'd come out of school, middle school, high school, she'd walk across the street and I'd get the download of the whole day. She didn't knock in my office, I'd be in my office working, sometimes I'd be on the phone, I'd be doing whatever else, and the door would just go, if, if we were loud enough, people were talking, she'd wait. I will give you credit there, if, she, if somebody was in the office, sometimes. But most of the time, it was just, she'd walk in, drop her stuff down, sit down on the couch. And then I would hear about the day. And you know what? I didn't get mad at her about it. I, I laughed. Uh, I would try to remember as much as I could because... I would get the immediate download and then I'd get home and mom would say to Alyssa, how was your day? And she's like, yeah, it was okay, you know. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to try to regurgitate the important parts. But the door was closed and she just walked in because of the relationship. You know what I'm saying. There was, there was no questions asked, just walk in, sit down, it's dad. And so when we come before the father, when we come to him in prayer, when we come to him uh, to seek his face for anything, we, we should come with that confidence that this is my Father in heaven who loves me. He is concerned for me. He's concerned for what concerns me. He already knows what I'm going to ask before I ask it. He's okay with it. He has invited me to come in and to seek his face. Here we just read it, ask, seek, and knock, and we're going to talk about it. But, but if we're invited in, we should come in. Amen? How silly would it be to be invited in and never walk into that presence? So understanding is very important, and it's, it's the most important part of praying when we look at this. In Psalm 47, verse 7, it says, For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. And I preached on that one time about if we're going to praise God, we need to praise Him with understanding. Not in ignorance, not just saying a few rhyming words or things that don't make any sense. There needs to be some understanding in what we're doing. I can tell you this, that when we approach God with an understanding of who He is, praise will rise up in us. If we're waiting for music to move us, if we're waiting for a style to move us or a certain song to move us, uh, we're going to be waiting a long time. But if we will be moved by an understanding of who the Father is, I don't even need words to get there. You know, I don't even need music. I can get there pretty quickly myself. 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit and I will also sing with understanding. And so... As we approach the Lord, I understand if you're praying in, in tongues, if you're praying in the Spirit, you may not understand what you're praying for in that moment. It may be self-edifying. There are other times where you may begin to pray in the Spirit in an understood way over somebody's life in a very prophetic way, and the Lord bring understanding through that. So we must be men and women of God who don't live our lives uh, just saying repetitive prayers like pagans that don't make any kind of sense, but we are in relationship with God we speak to Him with thoughts. Uh, even when we don't know how we ought to pray, the Spirit prays for us. But even in those moments, we are approaching the Lord with understanding that He is Lord, He is our Father, and He loves us. So in Luke eleven five 5 through 8, it says the friend is worldly. They're imperfect. It's an imperfect example. And it says that persistency pays off and the request was granted even though the heart of the friend did it begrudgingly. What I want to encourage us with today, there's a lot of times as you read that short parable, Jesus is teaching them the model of prayer, but then he follows it up with the heart of it, the understanding of it. And the model of the prayer is one thing, but the understanding of it is just important. So he gives this short parable of an imperfect friend who by persistence can be moved. 
And it's easy at first glance here is now to evaluate it from a mindset that says, oh, okay, so God is saying that if he doesn't move immediately like we think he should, then we should just become louder, more bold, and more persistent to get him to begrudgingly do what he doesn't want to do for us. That is a wrong interpretation, okay? That's not the interpretation that we should be grasping from this. What we should grasp and understand is, is that a worldly evil person will do it by your uh, persistence, but God will respond because he's a father who loves you. God is not a wicked friend who is self-consumed in his bed and not wanting to be inconvenienced by you. Do you know that you cannot inconvenience God? He never sleeps. You don't have to have him come from somewhere far off because he's already near you. You can't inconvenience an omniscient, omnipotent. You can't wear out an all-powerful God. It's impossible to inconvenience God. Don't you remember that was the argument that Elijah had with the prophets of Baal? Shout louder. Maybe, maybe he's on holiday. Maybe he's out of town. Maybe. But we serve a living God that we can approach him like Elijah approached that altar with a simple prayer and he can move because he's good. We need to approach him understanding that. And this is similar. If you want to flip over to Luke 8, there's another parable, very similar, I believe, to have pretty much the same message to it that we can grasp as it pertains to prayer tonight. Luke 8, verses 1 through 8. I believe it's Luke 8. Sometimes when I copy things over into my notes, I don't always put the right chapter down. I think I have the right chapter. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them. Am I in the right chapter about the unmerciful judge? Is it 18? It's Luke 18, isn't it? Help me. There we go. That's what it is. Hey, Luke 18, y'all, I thought that 8 didn't look right in my notes. Luke 18, sorry about that. See, it's a little test, see? Just a little test for you. It was on purpose. Yeah, it's not true, is it? I just looked at it and I thought, I think that's 18, not 8. So anyway, verse 1, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. And he said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary, for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I'm, I don't fear God or care about men, even though I don't fear God and I don't care about men, that's the judge's attitude, okay? Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. You ever feel like that before? And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Now who is... Is Jesus, what kind of a judge is Jesus? Do you all remember scripturally what kind of a judge Jesus is? Righteous. He's the righteous judge, okay? So this is not referring to God. This is an example of a worldly person in a circumstance that probably did happen and does happen that we can comprehend what Jesus is trying to teach us. Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So, again, on the topic of persistent prayer, is this the only thing it's calling us to? Should we be persistent in prayer? Is that in here? Yes, yes we should. We should pray. We should be men and women who pray. And people have said, Pastor, shouldn't we pray once and leave it and trust God with it? Or should we continue praying about something? And I, I think there's scriptural backing for both things. I would say and encourage you, you pray. If you feel a release from it, release it. Amen? You pray about it, you feel a release, release it. If you pray about it, you don't sense a release, you need to keep interceding, continue interceding. But as you do, don't view God as an unfriendly, self-centered friend and an unjust judge. Just be persistent and know that God is good. He loves you and he will, as this says, 
come quickly to bring justice. Right? So, Jesus says, if you want to go back to chapter 11, He says that they should ask, seek, and knock. And it's the greatest acronym I've ever seen in my life. It's the greatest thing ever. Ask, seek, or knock is the acronym ASK. It's the easiest thing to remember, right? And it is a thing of persistence, not because God doesn't hear us, not because God isn't good and doesn't care, not because God is angry with us, but because God is sovereign. He knows things that we don't know. My ways are not your ways, says the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord, right? He's sovereign. And so we seek him on these things, and we believe him to move, and he will move in his season and in his timing. And in, in a way that is good, even if we don't fully understand his goodness in the situation. At some point, we have to settle into the goodness of God. I'm going to be preaching on this on Sunday from Deuteronomy 29, 29, about the fact that there's this double promise there. It says the secret things belong to the Lord, but the, the, the oh, I've forgotten the other half of it. My mind just went blank. But it's talking about those things that have been given to them are theirs to obey uh, for generation to generation. Huh? Revealed, revealed, that's the word. I kept thinking revelation. The things revealed are, were for them to have from generation to generation. So, so there are two things there. There's, there are hidden things that we don't know that, that are deep in the bath of the sovereignty of God, of who He is. Those things are secrets that will be revealed to us in the right time. They're there to be sought. They're there to be uh, looked after and pursued in some level. But in the meantime, we obey. What I know. Well, why is my child not being healed? Well, the answer to that question is somewhere in the secret of God. That belongs to him. I don't understand it. I don't know it. Here's what I do know. God is good. Here's what I will do. I will obey him. I will pray for her. I will anoint her with oil. I will believe for her. I will bring her to the Father every day. Whether she's sick, whether she's well, I will bring her to the Father every day because she's my child and I love her. And that's what I will obey God in. I will train up my child in the way they should go. I want them well. I'm bringing her to God to be well. And, and, and that answer is still somewhere off in his sovereignty. I don't get it. I don't understand it, but I'm going to remind myself that he's good, he sees me, he knows what's best, he loves me, he will respond in his season and his timing for what is best for his purpose in his kingdom. So I will trust that he has a mystery to it, and I will obey in the things that I know I need to obey in, and all of it I will trust God. And I believe in due time I will see the things that I've been praying for. That's how we approach God. I don't, I don't have to get angry with him. Even though our flesh rises up, I don't have to judge him and make him out to be some kind of a man who doesn't see and doesn't hear and doesn't comprehend. I mean, he, he can sympathize with us in all of our weaknesses because he was like us. He was tempted in every way and found without sin. That's the guy we come to. That's God. That's who we come to. So if we can get that in our spirit, okay, if we can get the middle part of what we read between verses 1 and 13 in our spirit, if we can get about the widow in our spirit and about the and get that understanding of persistency, yet at the same time knowing God is not like man, he's good, we can ask, seek, and knock with persistence in a way that is obedient, in a way that is honorable to him, and we can receive from him. We just can. And so... Any thoughts or questions on anything we talk about? Is it going to be a good one, Chris? Because I'm not in the mood for anything bad. <laughs> Just kidding. What is it, buddy? Uh, I think this is the only thing that the uh, apostles asked him to teach them. Yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see Jesus being persistent in any single place. That we're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the greatest, the greatest prayer from a sinner is, Father, give me, I'm a sinner, I repent, right. yeah. That prayer is yeah. true. Um, 
It's all of it. For sure. I, I definitely got hung up on why should I keep going to the Father? Jesus didn't. Right. For the same thing, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, why isn't my prayer of faith enough the first time? Because you don't have enough faith. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Well, that could be the. That could be it could. It can play a role in it. It really can. Or, or it's what you said. Or yeah. sin. Sin. Or or when you're not treating your wife correctly or right, I don't know if that's necessarily sin. It's. But it it would have to be a willful thing. It, right. it would it would have to be a knowledge thing of. It's all of it. Is yes. What I'm trying to say. Right. And I'm not trying to confuse anyone, but but what drives me nuts is. In the religious world that we live in, mm -hmm. they want everyone to pray. Mm -hmm. Regard, there's no stipulation. There's no, you know, come as you are, pray as you are. There's no, there's nothing. You can pray, and we we just think the more the better. Mm -hmm. So I got a problem with that. Well, every religion prays to something, you know, yeah. But even I was sharing with Tony the other day a little poster in, at OSF in observance of World Day of the Sick. They want everyone to, to pray. pray. Yeah. The well, the scripture says that the prayer of a righteous right. man availeth much. So, And it's not just man, it's ladies too. Again, written to men, but same principle, right? So you, you pray and believe and righteousness plays a role, and that's what we've been talking about. Sick, you know, uh, sin, or if a person is unconverted. Good point on that. It's key. Uh, and the National Day of Prayer is coming up May 5th or something, so you're saying you're not going to the courthouse and praying with us? because I'm just kidding, Chris. I'm trying to, stir, <laughs> trying to stir you up. I could find myself there right now. I could find myself there. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to be confusing. I know you're not. It, but it's I know your heart. I know your heart. But. I'm looking at all this. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, and, it, and if there's doubt there, then deal with the doubt. Right. You know, find the confidence in yes. just knowing that, that God heard your prayer. Right. And and you brought up some really difficult situations. You know, why is my child still sick? Right. You know. Uh, well, you need to find out. Right. Exactly. Why, why would you? Right. For sure. And that's and that's where you go to go into uh, deep intercession in a lot of ways, not just for their healing, but but what is this? You know, is it spiritual? Is it natural? Is it, is this physical alone? You know, what, what is this? And, and so that's where, as we pursue, I believe that in the depth of God's knowledge and understanding, uh, that's where the answers lie. And we're not going to find those if we don't step into that ocean and vastness of who he is and seek that out. Um, so that's the important part. The, the key is, is yes, I'll be persistent, but not with an attitude that sees God as unjust, not with an attitude that sees God as withholding from me because he's not good, anything that, but to approach him, he's good, I trust him. And so whatever that is in his sovereignty, I don't understand just yet, but we're going to keep seeking because that's what we've been told to do. Jesus said, don't be like the Greeks, I think he said, who pray in repetition. Right, in babblings. Well, there's no faith there. Right. So, so I had to come to the conclusion that if I am going to be praying with a persistence on a prayer, then... Each time I pray, it's, it's with the same faith. Mm -hmm. I know it's there. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm so confident. I know that this is what God would have me do, not just for the prayer, even though I know he heard me. It's really more for myself. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's a lot going on there. Yeah, you brought up the times Jesus prayed, and we don't see him repeating the same prayer over and over, but we do see him going off to pray. Of he was persistent in prayer. Yes. And, and so the only time I think we see him repeating himself when he was saying, Lord... If it's your will, take this cup from me, but not my will, your will be done. He repeats that twice. He's encouraged by angels uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he goes off and obeys the Lord in that. Um, I think that's the only time we really see him repeat something of that nature. But Jesus was persistent in his pursuit of the Father, and I think that's where our persistence needs to be. So within that persistence, for the sake of time, unless anybody has anything else to add. Yes? So, so it says he's looking for faith. Yes. Right. Um, and James 1, we, all, we know that I don't want to discount the faith healing stuff. 
Sometimes no, you, you can't. Sometimes, sometimes you get it right then and there. Mm -hmm. But James 1 says that knowing that the testing of our faith produces endurance. So it's an enduring faith. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a right now faith. Other times it's an enduring faith. When are you going to preach that? <laughs> okay, May 29th it is. It sounds good. So I agree with that 100%. That's really, really good. Joyce, yes. Yes. Come on. See, we're going places now, aren't we? I'm thinking, well, that means you're showing trust. Yes. If you pray with thanksgiving, yes. seeing it done. Mm -hmm. I have begun, and I, told, I may have told you this on Wednesday night. I know I've shared it with others, but I had to begin at certain things in my life. I caught myself moving into kind of the unjust judge attitude, like, come on, God, I, and, I, and the Holy Spirit convicted me of that very thing. And so I began to start thanking Him for those things. Not that, not that there's a need, but thanking Him in advance for what He's going to do in that situation. Because God, I know you know that situation. I know you know my heart. I thank you that in your timing, we're going to see this. And some of those things, I've, I've watched Him work really cool things out. So yeah, the key, that thanksgiving, again, we can come to him with thanksgiving because we know he's not a self-centered friend that's inconvenienced by us and he's not an unjust judge. We can come to him in faith with a thankful heart that says he's going to hear me and he's going to respond. And he's faithful. 100%, yes. And we know that things aren't done necessarily in our time. Correct. In his time. Yeah. About the time somebody tells you that all the promises of God, you will see all of them come to pass. I will turn you to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Because. Right. Faith doesn't mean you see all of it happen. It means you endured to the end. Um, and the good news is, is we get to see all the glorious things on the way. I, I was reading, while I was on the beach, I was reading some F.W. Borum, and I know I've mentioned Borum a lot, but um, I don't know. I've been reading an old dead Baptist guy for a while here recently, but. He inspires me. His writings are a little bit poetic and, and deep, and I, I just enjoy it. And so um, one of the things I read while I was sitting on the beach, it was really cool, uh, a, a book called The Golden Milestone, and I was reading it and didn't even know what was in it, but a lot of, his, a lot of the things that he inspires, inspires him from nature, he and I think alike a lot, and so it, I like it. He was talking about the beach a lot, and I was like, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, this is awesome, yeah. But he, he talked about the account of the little boy. Um, it was a, I assume it was a parable, um, a fable, a little boy chasing the gold at the end of the rainbow and uh, pursuing it and all of those things. You know, and it was something that was a common understanding from their stories back in the day in the late 1800s. And, but he said, you know, the little boy never did get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but because he pursued, he discovered so many other more beautiful things. And... And he equated that with us seeking God. You know, there, there are things that when we seek Christ, we may have certain ends in mind when we pursue things. Think, well, I'm going to seek God and get this, this, and this, and this. And we may never get this, this, and this, and this. But God leads us on a beautiful journey where we discover so much more than we ever dreamed or imagined. Better things, you know, more eternal things. So this whole thing about seeking is the most important part. So let's close this up. I, we won't pray through the model for sake of time tonight, but... Um, you know, obviously the Lord's Prayer, as it's referred to, uh, which could be referred to as the Disciples' Prayer because the Lord told the disciples to pray this way. But, but really, it just kind of covers the basis here, um, our Father in Heaven. So in other words, we come to Him with a praise and hallowing of who He is, His name, His will, His kingdom. Um, you know, so we approach Him with the humble yet loved position of a son or a daughter. We approach God with praise and thanksgiving. So, you know, when you, in your prayer life, if you take this with you and use it, that's fine. Some of you probably already have it or have used it after our prayer meeting that night. And obviously, I know not all of us were here for that. But um, if you struggle with a prayer life, man, make the front of it just understanding of who He is. If you can't think of a long list of who He is and things he, you know, that describe who He is, just turn it into a praise of goodness. And, and maybe you need to make some notes on your phone when you think of different things so you've got it in front of you. But get into his presence with praise, not necessarily a song. If you use a song or use some worship music, whatever, just make sure that you're bringing praise to God. Okay, You're exalting the Father. You're coming to him humble, yet as a loved son or a daughter. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
acknowledge his kingship and align yourself with his kingdom purpose in the world. We know what his kingdom purpose is. His kingdom purpose is going to all the world, right? The great commission and the great commandment. You can't have one without the other. Great commission of going to all the world, preach the gospel, right? The great commandment, love your brothers yourself. What are those two things? It's the exact same thing that uh, love God, love your neighbor, right? So we've got to do those things. His kingdom come, his will be done, and we must acknowledge it. Are there things stirring in your spirit that are connected to his lordship and great commission? Are there things he's calling you to do? There's a great place. This is a great place to pray for souls, for friends who need Jesus. Target that coworker that you know is just bound up in sin and pray for them and begin to believe that family member, that child, that whoever, and just be, begin to believe God to work. Give us day by day our daily bread. We all have physical needs. You know it's okay to ask God when there's a need. It's okay. It's okay. But it's also okay to approach him with the understanding, knowing that the Father knows you need these things before you ask, right? Seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given unto you. This is a great place uh, for the daily needs is to pray with thanksgiving. Thank you, Father, that you're, you're going to meet this need. Thank you, Father, you're providing here. Thank you, God, that you're going to do those things. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who has indebted us. This is um, time to do some house cleaning. Are there things that you... Things in you that the Holy Spirit has brought to your attention? Are there, is, is there sin to be repented of or a battle to be overcome? Pray about that and see the victory. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's God's will that you will be an overcomer. Pray that he will help you to continue to overcome and trust him to finish that work in you, right? For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. The doxology was just added in there, but, but uh, not recorded in this book. But we can look at these things and we know that I've got to pray about all of this stuff. I've got to pray in praise. I've got to pray and believe for his sovereignty, his will, his kingdom. I've got to be engaged in that. I've got to be busy about what's natural needs are taking place. It's okay to pray about those things. And some days, don't turn this into a religious pattern. Some day may need to be a repentance day. You know what I'm saying? Some day may be focused more on somebody else's needs. Some day may be an intercession for a friend. Some people say, well, I don't know if I prayed adequately. I didn't pray every single one of those. Listen, if you prayed and you came to the Father with an attitude that says, your kingdom come, your will be done in my life, you prayed. Don't turn it into some kind of a religious repetitious thing, but use it as a pattern to evaluate yourself and to help you stay focused on, okay, Lord, uh, part three of this may be where my heart is today, so I'm going to spend a little bit extra time here repenting because I did something the other day that was stupid. And Father, evaluate me and help me find if there's anything else in me that needs to be corrected. I want, I want to be in alignment with your holiness and your goodness. I mean, when we turn our lives into that attitude, we're going to touch heaven. Amen. Thoughts or questions before we pray and get out of here? Such a beautiful day outside. Huh? Accupra. Oh, I got accusations for you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. You're just good, God. We glorify you, Jesus. We thank you. And uh, for this time tonight, I pray it's encouraging. For those that are here, those that have joined us online, Father, just to know that you hear us. That as your children, a born again child of God, you hear our prayers. If there be anybody, anybody joining us online, God, that doesn't know you, I pray they would call out in that prayer of a sinner that they would make you the Lord of their lives. They would repent of their sins. And they would take a step into that vast life of eternal life with you, Father. And God, with every prayer that's offered up, keep our hearts in alignment with you. May we not view you as a man, because you're not a man. May we understand you. And God, I thank you that you're a God of justice. I thank you that you're going to come quickly. I thank you, Father, that you hear us, and I thank you that you move on our behalf for what is best in this season. We submit all to you, and we thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. This Sunday is our 100th day of reading together. We will have a little bit of a celebration, so you don't want to miss that. Oh, it's going to be great. $100 bill for everybody, $100 bill for everybody that comes to church. Bring your own. 
Bring your own $100 bill and you can exchange them amongst yourselves. It'll be great. <laughs> to carry in $100 bill exchange. Please tithe on every exchange of the $100 bill. God bless you all. We love you. Have a great rest of the week.